Hey everyone, in this video I'm going to be talking about six stocks that I'm going to be watching very closely this week in the market. Potentially if these continue to go down or get good news, I may be buying these stocks this week. So I want to go through them one by one, talk about some background as to why I may be buying the stock and what's going on with these companies, why I'll be watching them throughout the week. If you like this kind of content, just be sure to give me a big thumbs up on this video. It really does help a lot with the channel and we're going to get right into it. The first stock, as you can see on the screen, is Restaurant Brands International, ticker QSR. This company here has been on a bit of a run over the last year. You see it went from low 70s all the way up to about 100 bucks a share, so ripped about 40 50%. Since then, it's been dipping down pretty, pretty aggressively over the last, call it, um, few months uh, from 102 a share all the way down to about 102 or $92. So dipped about 10, 12% there. Looking at this company, this company owns Tim Hortons, Popeyes, Burger King, also owns Firehouse Sub, and they are primarily a franchisor. So they own the trademarks of these brands and they work on expanding them globally, working on menu innov innovations and initiatives to drive same store sales growth, uh, marketing initiatives, so on and so forth. You can see how fast they've grown, some by acquisition, uh, as we look at things like Popeye's getting added to the mix, which was an acquisition. Firehouse Subs, a very small acquisition, just about a billion dollars that they added a couple years back is not in this chart. And they really show what their model is here to compound business development throughout their network from a same store sales growth, uh, also a restaurant growth number. But if you look at the grand scheme of things here, they have four brands Lots of them very well known globally as we talk about Bur Burger King, Tim Hortons, they're expanding globally now, Popeyes, they have a lot more runway um, in developed markets on, and then Firehouse Subs is a bit of an incubator. And all of these are extremely profitable brands given their franchising layout, since they're not really uh, having operating costs of many of these restaurants. For the most part, they're just getting in the income from um, royalty fees, uh, licensing fees, things like that. So when we look at their earnings per share here, I'm going to do about $4.50 this year, $4.70 next year. So $4.70 times 20, if I slap a 20 price to earnings on it, is $94 a share for 20 times next year's earnings. And we're currently at 92. So we're under 20x next year's earnings. When I look at some of their competitors like McDonald's, um, they're trading probably at 25 25, 26 times, 24 times next year. Yum Brands is another one that they compete with um, that is trading at a very similar multiple to McDonald's. So I just think that one, you're getting the benefit of a cheaper valuation by about 20, 25% off these guys. Two, you're getting a better starting dividend yield at about three to 4% on this stock versus, um, versus some of the other big companies here. Yeah, but uh, I think 3.3, 3.4%. Um, this is the U.S. ticker. I just go to there for the dividend because they don't show it on the Canadian one sometimes. Um, and also you get the benefit if you're living uh, and investing in Canada of not needing to deal with the foreign exchange taxes or the tax with the, the tax on U.S. dividends, stuff like that. So really efficient stock to be investing in in Canada at a cheaper valuation than lots of their global competitors, despite the fact that this is a global company. So I like that forward PE of under 20. That's something I'm going to keep watching as it continues to hopefully or potentially go down in price, um, may become more and more attractive to be adding more shares of Restaurant Brands International to my portfolio. The second stock I'm going to be looking at this week is CIBC. So CIBC, as I look at this stock here, it's down almost 17% in the last year alone currently trading with a starting yield of over 6.5%. Now, I got to admit, I've been talking a lot and looking a lot at TD Bank, uh, which is um, my favorite Canadian bank stock, my one of my biggest positions in my portfolio, as well as Scotiabank, which has just cratered recently behind their Latin American exposure, currently yielding about 6.5% as well. And I've just not really looked at CIBC for a while here, um, assuming that Scotiabank was... Uh, cheaper valuation, higher dividend yield, but CIBC actually has a 6.5% dividend yield and they don't even have the worry of what's going to go on and transpire in the Latin American economy like Scotiabank. So this is a really attractive local bank to be owning at these levels. Over the long term here, we can see, if I refresh the page here, 
um, that this company has done really well over the last five years, over the last um, decade, two decades. Uh, it All of the Canadian banks essentially operate in an oligopoly here. So up over 500% in the last, I know that's a long uh, chart, but in the last 30 years or so. But even if I looked at uh, the last 10 years going to 2013, we're still up a good 40%. And on top of that, you've been getting a nice 4 or 5% dividend along the way. They also increase their dividend most years as well. Looking at their business here, um, they're primarily in Canada, but they do have some wealth management in the US and some global exposure. Uh, and then the other thing I just want to call out is their loan book or their, their mix of loans. Over half of it is in mortgages, only 10% in commercial real estate, which is a pretty small amount. Um, and then as you look across uh, the the book here, I really like the fact lots of people penalize them for having such a big mortgage book in case the Canadian housing market crashes. I don't think it's going to crash to a great extent. Um, and obviously, the owners of those mortgages also have principal invested in stuff like that. So they're probably not just going to walk away unless something dire happened. Um, so I actually like, I think this is actually safer than obviously commercial real estate, um, personal loans, government loans, stuff like that. So I don't mind their loan book at all. Where it really comes full circle in terms of why I'm looking at this one closely is the valuation. They're expected to do 675 both this year and next year. So it's no growth that's being forecasted on CIBC. But going back to their current share price of $53, 675 means that this company is trading eight times current year earnings. So eight times current year earnings on a company that is in a spot that's really hard to disrupt. They pretty much are part of an oligopoly. You're getting a 6.5% starting yield, a dividend growth history of decades and decades on a company like CIBC. I think that's a great entry point, in my opinion, to continue accumulating more shares of CIBC. So I really like the earnings power that they're going to be pushing off here of close to 7 bucks a share, um, the dividend that they're paying out at 6.5%. And this is one that I'm watching really closely as they're just sitting at 52-week lows uh, in terms of if it would be a good time to buy some more shares of CIBC. I haven't bought in CIBC shares in years and years, uh, but it's definitely getting enticing at this level. So it's definitely on my watch list for this week. Going into the third stock here, it is the Walt Disney Company. So Walt Disney, um, I own a bit of Walt Disney shares similar to CIBC. I haven't bought Walt Disney in probably three or four years. And I'm actually down on my position, as you can probably see when we go to the five-year chart here. Um, I was probably buying around this point here. I think my average price is around 115-ish, give or take. So down about 25% um, overall given the, the crash that the company's had and all the challenges that they've had. Uh, they obviously have a very public dispute going on right now with Charter on streaming of ABC, Disney Channel, ESPN, etc. A lot more drama on ESPN. Lots of clouds around um, the future of their linear business. Uh, what streaming profitability is going to look like if there's deceleration of traction at the park. There's so many sound bites and rumors and things going on with this company. Also, the acquisition of Hulu is pending um, January, February, 2024, I believe. And they're going to have to make a decision on that without a lot of capital uh, right now on their balance sheet. So it's a lot going on here. Just looking at the estimates this year, they're expected to do about four bucks in EPS. So trading at about 21, 22 times next year, closer to five times. So $5 of EPS. So that would be about a 16 times PE, 16, 17 times uh, given current price. But I think there's a lot of puts and calls on these numbers. Their earnings are really volatile, very hard to forecast with all the moving parts in this company. So this is one that um, I haven't bought in probably five years or so. And I'm just keeping a close eye on it as they reach like 30-year lows, I believe, on the stock. Um, it may just be one that... Um, or not 30-year lows, but pretty, pretty big lows. It may be one that uh, at some point I start averaging down into a bit uh, just because they do still have a lot of great intellectual property, um, a, a great um, streaming business in terms of how many people they've been able to sign up. They just need to get the economics right. Uh, and the park business as well is really strong. So it, it's one that I've been really hesitant to jump in on, mostly because you know you don't really be competing 
as a $150 billion company only in entertainment, it's really tough to compete against companies like Apple and Amazon and all these other companies with trillions of dollars um, and really not a need to make money in their entertainment division. But I still think that Walt Disney is a great asset. If it goes down too much, it may get scooped up or acquired. And I think I'll make a good amount of return off of that. Uh, and if it starts dipping into, you know, the low 70s or market cap in the $120 billion range, I just think they have a lot of intrinsic value in the brands and the real estate and the parks that they own. So I'm a bit farther away from pulling the trigger on this one as I am on something like CIBC trading at eight times earnings, but it's definitely one that's piqued my interest given how low it has gotten um, right here at about $80 a share. Okay, going into the fourth stock that I'm looking at buying for this week or considering buying, it is Realty Income. So Realty Income is actually a stock that I do own. I started buying it um, just a few months ago. I think I started buying around 60 bucks a share, 62 bucks a share, probably somewhere around here. And I've been averaging down a tiny bit, but I haven't really made a big push into the stock um, in my uh, Wealth Simple account. So currently trading at $55 a share. I think that's good for about a 5.5% dividend yield, uh, given the current value. They just bought a 20% stake in the Bellagio, so really expanding um, more into gaming and different uh, real estate opportunities outside of just retail. They also have been expanding into Europe and Italy and Spain, so I like all the diversification that they're bringing to the table for my portfolio um, and right now they're expecting to do about $4 of funds from operation. So they're trading right around 14 times or so um, funds from operation, which for a really strong REIT with very diversified assets and triple net leases, so a lot of um, predictability to the business, uh, I think it's trading at a, at a really fair multiple. Um, in addition to that, obviously the stock's been weighed down over the last number of years behind interest rates going up. And I think this company, as soon as kind of the coin flips the other way, interest rates start potentially going down. Um, I think this company will benefit greatly from that, just from a valuation standpoint and operationally servicing that debt. You see before the pandemic here, they're trading at 80 bucks a share. So down 30% from 2020 um, still despite having really strong funds from operations and rent collection, et cetera, expansion in new markets. So this is one that is out of favor right now. I think it's one that um, will eventually come back in and I'm looking to uh, potentially accumulate more shares of this one if it continues to trend downwards, to average down, uh, dollar cost average down on my position and you know have a really bulky position. So when this one um, potentially does climb back up, uh, I don't uh, have to uh, worry about getting in at those higher prices. Looking at just at some of their tenants and the landscape of, of, of their business, you can see how defensive some of their tenants are. They bought the Win Encore in Boston, so that was their first jump into gaming before they just invested in Bellagio a bit. Uh, they are very diversified per state. You can see some of their top states here, Texas, California, Illinois, Florida, Massachusetts. They also have about 10% of their business in the UK before they expanded into Italy and Spain as well. And then from a type of store standpoint, grocery stores, convenience store, dollar store, uh, drug store, quick service restaurant, home improvement, all of these are things that re really can't get significantly, um, significantly disrupted by a company like Amazon or, or direct to consumer. You also have like automotive services, health and fitness, um, which you know may have some <laughs> COVID or pandemic risk, uh, but for the most part, uh, they have a really nice mix of tenants and, and types of real estate that if one starts to underperform, it, it won't sink the company in any significant way. So, for example, they have a couple movie theaters, um, but despite them having some issues with, with those tenants uh, and, and that part of the economy right now, it's such a small piece of the overall pie that you don't even really realize it. You see here AMC is about 1%. They may have a couple other ones, but it's just very small nominal rounding errors on the overall company given how diversified they are, which is, which is great. The fifth stock I'll be looking at this week is a bit out there. It is the WWE World Wrestling Entertainment. This one is actually merging with the UFC on September 12th. So throughout this week, create a new company called the TKA, TKO Group. Um, and they'll own WWE and UFC. So it's like a pure play um, wrestling 
martial arts, fighting, entertainment, media company, which will be really interesting. Um, I think uh, assuming WWE was at $104 a share, the value of the equity is going to be at about $13 billion or something like that between the, the two companies. Um, I may need to fact check that, but uh, this one is just going to be interesting to, to see how it uh, plays out if the stock combined stock goes down in value, up in value. I'm not sure I'm necessarily going to invest, but I definitely want to be there and evaluate it whenever the company, whenever a new company um, in the media space or in the entertainment space gets together uh, to see if I think there may be a net opportunity depending on how the stock reacts. So just going to a bit more information this is Endeavor, who currently owns UFC, them going into um, some details here. So you can see they're calling the new TKA group is now what it's called, or T, yeah, TKO group, but they call it NUCO here. Um, it's going to be combining UFC and WWE, two iconic companies with leading brands in respective categories. They think there's opportunities to glow, to grow rather, um, under one roof. Also, they have leverage for things like TV deals, stuff like that, um, that hopefully they can drive synergies and create a lot of incremental value behind. They kind of show here um, how they got to their valuation levels. So uh, they're, they're assuming that uh, UFC or WWE rather would be at $106 a share. That was the, the value they put on it. Um, and at that, it would be worth $9 billion. And then they're also assuming um, equity value of UFC being 9.4. So actually, um, my $13 billion number was, was wrong. It looks like at $106 a share, the combined company will be worth about $18 billion. If I look at what it's trading at today, 7 8% below that. So they're probably currently valued at about $17 billion. We'll see what the company value opens at this week. That's what I'm really interested to see, how much debt they load up on the balance sheet, things like that. And then just looking at their businesses, I found this to be interesting. So 75% of WWE and 70% of UFC's revenue comes straight from media. And then consumer products, so things like t-shirts, merchandising, two times as big as the, as part of the revenue mix for WWE as the UFC. The UFC makes significantly more money from sponsorships, which makes sense. Um, and live events is about the same in terms of ticket sales by going in. So that's um, one thing that I found really interesting, just looking at the revenue breakdowns of these two companies, where they're similar, where they're different. For the most part, they're pretty similar, just a couple nuances between merchandising and sponsorships. Okay, going into the last stock that I'll be watching throughout the week, it is S&P Global. So I've recently bought a position in S&P Global, um, just about five shares of it over the last few weeks. They're trading at a future PE of about 28, 29. So the PE ratio here is a bit inflated. Not sure if it was a write-off or something um, in the trailing 12 months that's impacting that. But really like um, this business, huge mode on the company. So I know I'm buying it at a huge um, or a pretty expensive valuation, but I think there's good reason for that. This is one that I'd love to build into a bigger position over time. So it's one that I'm continuing to watch to see if it trends down. You can see here, it's kind of trended up nicely throughout the year, even jumped up here to $420 a share in the summer. Um, but currently at 390, my average price is right around 390, 389. So I'd love for this one to dip down, to be honest, because it's such a small position for me. Um, currently would love to get this one, uh, you know, 380, 370, start buying it at a future PE. Um, of like 27, 26, that would be great. So I'm keeping an eye on this one. We'll be continuing to average in on any weakness with the objective of building it into a bigger position. Looking at some of the aspects of this company that I do like, I love their ratings business. They rate debt from all around the world. Anytime any major um, investment bank or uh, hedge fund or whatnot buys uh, a security, it's usually rated by either S&P Global or Moody's. Uh, and if it's not rated by one of those two companies, big time investors do not touch those things just to protect themselves and, and their investors as well. OK, so this is like a duopoly between these two companies. And no matter what's going on in the economy, there's always some need to do this type of work. If companies are losing a lot of money, like during the pandemic, they need to raise a bunch of debts. Um, then they'll do a bond issuance and they'll need Moody's or S&P Global to um, rate the, the value of the bonds um, and what the coupon yield on those bonds should be given the risk associated 
um, with that company at that time and that security. So they have a really big business here, over $4 billion of revenue a couple years ago, 64% operating margins, which is great. Their market intelligence business, I don't know as much about, but I think they just collect um, data and probably pay for data, collect it, um, and then dish it out to people who need access to it, whether that's hedge funds or people doing specific analysis. Um, so a bit lower margin, less of a, a moat there, about 34%. But then the last one here I really like as well, and it is their, oh, sorry, <laughs> they have another business here that is very similar. They, they provide independent provider of information, benchmarking of um, energy and commodity prices. So it's just um, market intelligence and, and stuff like that. Uh, but the last one here is what I was really uh, getting at. Not a huge part of the business, about 800 million. So about one third the size of their ratings business. But the S&P Dow Jones indices, um, in terms of owning the S&P, owning the Dow Jones, every ETF that uses an S&P or Dow Jones uh, copycat to show, sell people ETFs and, and exposure to those funds from around the world. S&P Global gets a couple basis points of the management fee of those ETFs as a fee for people piggybacking off of their ETFs and the work that they do in putting those ETFs together. And S&P 500 and Dow Jones has kind of become like the, the standard in the investment community. So lots of people just are investing in the S&P 500. And for all of those dollars going in, all of that asset under management, S&P Global is getting a few basis points off the top, and that's feeding this billion dollars in revenue, 70% margins, which is fantastic to run that division, and very, very <laughs> defensive. Um, obviously, if the value of the S&P goes down year to year, um, it may fluctuate a bit, but generally people are putting money in their retirement accounts and stuff in things like the S&P 500 and just holding them for life. So every year without even knowing it, um, consumers and, and retail investors and, and uh, larger investors too are feeding this billion dollars of revenue, providing $800 million of operating income for S&P Global. So I think they have a lot of great businesses. That's why they're an expensive company, um, but it's one that I think is very hard to disrupt and one that I would love to have a bigger stake in. So those are the six stocks that I'll be looking at throughout the week and you know some of the background as to why I will be evaluating them, considering purchasing them. Obviously, the ones that um, I'm probably closer to actually purchasing are, are S&P Global, um, Restaurant Brands International, and CIBC, as well as Realty Income, where Disney and uh, WWE, or soon-to-be TKO, TKO Group, have a hard time saying that, um, are more things I'm watching from the sidelines on, seeing if they drop dramatically in any way in price that may make it uh, more interesting for me. So hope you guys like this video. Love to hear what stocks you guys are buying or watching this week as well in the comments. And if you like this kind of content, be sure to give this video a big thumbs up. It really does help with the YouTube algorithm. If you haven't subscribed yet before, be sure to hit that subscribe button. We're growing the channel quickly. would love to have you along for the ride and I'll see you guys in the next one. Thanks.